Hello, uh, today I'm going to be talking about dynamic symmetry and how Peter Paul Rubens used it to compose his painting on Samson and Delilah. Hi, I'm Paolo Fabregas. I am a comic book artist. Uh, now, I have taken um, all kinds of classes online. I've taken New Masters Academy. I've even taken something from Aaron Blaze. There's, there's some bits on composition. There's a lot on composition in New Masters Academy. Nobody in New Masters Academy, at least when I was taking it, touched upon dynamic symmetry. And it was always a point of frustration on my part. I kept on wondering, okay, how do we decide that this important element in my painting goes there? What makes me think that that's an important place? How do I know to put it there? And they, more often than not, they just talk about the rule of thirds. And I see a lot, a lot of professional artists online just talking about rule of thirds, just apply the rule of thirds. And when I look at great art from the past, even from the Impressionists or even Pablo Picasso, it doesn't seem like they're using rule of thirds at all, right? Because they're not. The only class online that talked about dynamic symmetry, symmetry is Barnstone Studios, which I highly highly recommend. Uh, it's a bit stiff, right? And it's a bit exacting the way he teaches, but uh, I liked it. I like the discipline. And dynamic symmetry is what these old artists used. And there's a reason why. Again, if it's good enough for Michelangelo, if it's good enough for Rubens, it's going to be good enough for you. Okay. What is dynamic symmetry? First, before I get into this painting. Dynamic symmetry is the rules applied to a particular rectangle. So when you choose a rectangle, there are rules attached to it. Let's say you choose this rectangle. I know there's all these lines, but don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify it for, ah, crap. I'm gonna simplify it for you. All right, you have this rectangle in front of you. This is actually called a root five rectangle. It's a kind of complex rectangle, but it is what it is. Whenever you choose a rectangle, there's going to be a something called a Baroque diagonal, all right? And that's what that Baroque diagonal is. It leans to the right. And then you have its opposite. You have the sinister diagonal, sinister being, meaning left. It leans to the left, okay? So, so far, so good. It kind of looks like a very strange flag. Then you also have this thing called the reciprocal. What is that? The reciprocal is from this dot here. Um, it's the 90 degree point. Let me try to find it. 90 degree. This is the Baroque reciprocal, right? The 90 degrees. It's about there to the sinister. Okay. And then from this point, this kind of creates, it's called an eye. All right. This dot here. And then you can create another vertical line down. And in fact, you can use this Baroque or this Baroque reciprocal to create another square. And it goes down like this. Now here's the thing. This, this right here, this square is the same proportion as the larger square. All right. It's the same exact proportion. So it's the same. You're creating tiny divisions that are the same ad infinitum, ad inf but to infinity, right? I don't speak Latin. Why am I trying to speak Latin? So to infinity uh, with that. So you're creating those kinds of di divisions. So root fives, these are all root five rectangles. When I say root five, that means one. If this is one, this part up here is root five. So one is to root five. I forgot what the actual numbers are. It's like 1.7 maybe, I'm not sure. 1 is to 1.7, something like that. Um, and so on and so forth. You are making root 5 rectangles all throughout. Yes, are you with me? So you can even make the, the division here. That's another root 5 rectangle. And so on and so on. You can go on and on creating tiny little root 5 rectangles. Uh, of course, that's just the uh, sinister that's just the Baroque reciprocal that I was talking about. There is, of course, as well, the sinister reciprocal, which goes in the opposite direction, and it's the reciprocal of the Baroque diagonal, right? It's always 90 degrees. That's the basics of it. 
that's the basics of it. Whenever you choose a rectangle, it's like choosing a key in music. You're either in C major or you're in F major. There are notes that work, there are notes that don't, and uh, there are accidentals, of course, and there's all kinds of other things, but it's essentially it, right? You're choosing a key, you're choosing a rhythm, right? There are rules to the rectangle, and when you, when you don't use the rules of the rectangle, it feels off, something feels weird. How does this apply? This is the, uh, the final look, of course, of a root five rectangle. There's a lot of complexity here. There's even a square right there in the center, which I'm not getting into, but there's a lot, a lot of complexity that you can work with. And every single time a line hits another line, that's an I, and you can create another division from there, right? So it's always these straight lines going on. What does this have to do then with Peter Bohol? Peter Paul Rubens? What does this have to do with Rubens? Okay. Let's apply it. When I'm looking at this, it's, it's looking more like a square, right? It doesn't look like a root five rectangle, but Rubens hides his rectangle. He's very clever about it. What he has done, let me just turn down the opacity. What he's done is he stacked two root five rectangles on top of each other. You can come to me and say, oh, Paolo, that, that, that's not real. That's not real at all, really? Uh, let's, let's see, let's see. Let's find the, the root rec here. This is the sinister diagonal. Let me choose a better pen. There you go. There you go. That's a nice strong, pen. boom. Okay. That is the sinister diagonal of this piece of the root five. Now I'm going to just make this line. You can see it already. I'm sure you can see it. I'm going to make this line travel across her leg. It's right there on her leg. It's right there on her butt. It's right there on the angle of the dress. It's on the angle of her eyes. It's on the angle of Samson's back. It's on the angle of his back foot. It's on the angle of the eyes of, of the old lady. It's on the angle of the eyes of the man cutting. It is repeated. It's the angle on the arm of, of the old lady at the back. But let me, let me just continue drawing it right on top, right? Just, just so that you know that I'm not crazy. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's at her eyes. It's at her eyes. It's at his eyes. It's at his back. It's this gigantic flow. There's all of these. Boom, boom, boom. This gigantic. He's following one rhythm. It's following one pattern, right? And it's creating this, this rhythm, this gigantic thing, sinister diagonal, right? That's his main diagonal. That's the thing he's trying to emphasize. However, he's not done. He's not done. Of course he's not done. Because it's Rubens. Rubens is amazing. He has, of course, this thing right here. It's the sinister, sorry, the Baroque reciprocal, which is, again, the 90-degree angle from the diagonal. And then he repeats this angle. Look at that. The major thing. Bang. His arm. Right? his arm is right there on that reciprocal. And again, it's repeated to the angle of her face, to the angle of the old woman's face, the center line of the man's face, the angle of the scissors, the, uh, where else? Perhaps even the angle of her arm, right? And then the other side of his arm, the angle of her foot, the, 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 the her foot over there. He's, she, he's repeating this line over and over again, but not as much, not as strongly or as powerful as the diagonal, but it's there to give this contrast, to give this tension, to give this entire work this kind of power, right? It's this repetition. It's like classical music. Okay? But he's still not done because he has a continuing story. So this is the conflict, right? You have this conflict, this incredible tension. And then you have in the background, you have the Philistines. Let me create a Philistines layer. The Philistines shall be what color? Shall be blue. Okay. The Philistines are at the door and they're almost, the line is almost right. There's right there at the division of the root five rectangle. Maybe it's not perfect, but maybe that's the, it's the picture that's imperfect. Okay, and then what does he do with the vertical lines? The vertical lines he uses as a way to bring the action in. And I want you to see here, look at this division of the root five rectangle. It's absolutely perfect. 
and it's right on top of the major action of the piece, which is here, okay? That's the center point, the cutting of the, of the uh, hair. And this is where it's the lightest. So what, what's, he trying to tell, what's he trying to tell you here? The Philistines are coming in to attack Samson, okay? Did I mention the story of Samson Delilah? Did I even tell this story yet? Um, maybe I did. Okay, I've got confused because I've done this twice. The first time I didn't record the audio. Now I don't know whether or not I said it. I hope I said it. I'll say it again just in case. Okay, so the, the Philistines are coming in to attack, right? They're sneaking in. So all of the vertical lines represent the Philistines. And that's what you're trying to create, another layer of tension, right? If I remove everything, if I remove everything, which I will right now, okay? I'll remove the root five. I'll remove this. This is the abstract piece. It's the abstraction of that piece. It's just diagonals. It's the, the sinister diagonal, the Baroque reciprocal, and all of these vertical lines to represent the Philistines. And this is the undergirding and the underpinning of the painting. Then on top of that, he, he renders it absolutely beautifully, right? And then you don't see it. You don't, you don't feel it. You're just enjoying the music. Like, like when you're listening to, to Mozart, you're not thinking, I wonder what key is this in and what kind of rhythm it is. You just absolutely enjoy it, right? And it's the same thing here. There's a harmony on the page that is afforded to it because he is using dynamic symmetry. This is the bonus thing. And this isn't necessarily part of dynamic symmetry, but it, it is, I think, an incredibly important part of it it's this kind of, I don't know, it's not necessarily, I just think it's important. I want you to think about how, how unique uh, this entire position is, is of how the man is cutting Samson's hair. I feel this kind of circular action that's happening all across the, the painting. I, I feel it. I don't know if it's really there, but it's kind of like an instinct on my part. And I think he's using... A circle as well that just kind of goes around because you feel it here in the rhythm of his thing and I think the circles just get bigger right and I think it gets you feel it there and it goes around as well yeah, there's a circular rhythm that that's kind of permeating through it for me it's like a telescope now there's no dynamic symmetry lines to it this is I think an extra spice that Rubens is doing and something that perhaps that you can use too. He's just using the circle like a, like a telephoto lens. Like that's the important part. I think he's also using that rhythm. I feel it kind of like on an instinctual level. I'm sure he does it more mathematically than me and he has, he has much more precision with what I'm doing. I don't know. And perhaps if, if you, can, you can help me out there. There. So as you can see, Peter Paul Rubens did not use the rule of thirds. He used... Dynamic symmetry, right? He used the sinister diagonal, the Baroque reciprocal, and the horizontal lines to tell the story of Samson and Delilah. And again, if it's good enough for Rubens, it's good enough for you. God bless you. Have a nice day.